Hi, and welcome everyone. I'm Fernando LaGuarda, faculty director of the program on law and government at American University, Washington College of Law. The program on law and government supports research, scholarship, career, and events to support and further careers at the intersection of law and public policy. And we offer advanced degrees for lawyers in a wide range of fields, including the option for specialization in disability rights. You can learn more about us at wcl.american.edu. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, landmark legislation mandating baseline levels of access for the millions of Americans living with disabilities. The ADA's passage culminated decades of passionate disability rights and disability justice advocacy. Today, we kick off a year-long celebration of disability inclusion at WCL, which you can learn more about on our website and events page. I'd like to thank Verizon for sponsoring today's program and express my gratitude to the leaders of the Disability Rights Law Clinic the Disability Law Society, and the Student Bar Association at American University Washington College of Law for helping to make today's event so special. And a special thank you and shout out to Laura Herr, Michael Joseph, Denise Richards, Ryan Z, the Office of Special Events and Continuing Legal Education and the Office of Advancement and Alumni Relations. A word about the format. This program will include a mix of live and pre recorded content. <clears throat> you can select the captioning button at the bottom of your screen to see the live caption feed. When pre recorded content is playing, we will make sure that the ASL interpreter and video presentations are both spotlighted so they can be seen by all participants. When we are live, Anyone who requires ASL interpretation can pin the interpreter on their own screen. Viewers can choose gallery or speaker presentation mode on their own devices, depending on whether you wish to see all cameras or just those who are speaking. As soon as it can be made available, a recording and transcript of today's program will be posted to the website for the program on law and government. And now I'd like to introduce our host and moderator for today, WCL Acting Dean and Professor of Law, Robert Dinnerstein. Dean Dinnerstein is Director of the Disability Rights Law Clinic at WCL, where he has taught since 1983. He has previously served as the law school's Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Associate Dean for Experiential Education, and the director of WCL's renowned clinical education program. He has taught and written extensively in the fields of clinical education, disability law, mental disabilities law, the ADA, and the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, representation of clients with mental disabilities and the intersection of disability and international human rights. Before handing it over to Bob, let me again thank everyone for joining us today and for your continued support of the law school. And again, a special thanks to Verizon for their philanthropic support of this event. Dean Dinnerstein. Thank you, Fernando. Um, and I'm so pleased to be able to welcome uh, you to this webinar on the ADA at 30. Um, uh, this is an effort to look both backwards and forwards with regard to the ADA, the most important legislation uh, on disability rights that uh, the United States has enacted. Uh, I wanna also extend my thanks to our uh, to Verizon and to the other uh, co-sponsors and particularly uh, to thank Fernando LaGuarda who's really the uh, person who has put this all together uh, in a masterful way. Uh, and whatever success we have on this, I think will be due in no small part to his efforts. Um, as I think you know, uh, uh, the law school has uh, had a, uh, I think a longstanding focus on disability law, disability rights issues. Uh, as Fernando mentioned, we've had a disability rights law clinic, which I founded in 2005, uh, and I've taught disability law seminar for many years. I'm very excited that we have a vibrant uh, disability law society, which is a co-sponsor and uh, members of which you will be hearing from later today. Um, and so this, uh, for me as an acting being, to be able to host this uh, 
uh, event, both in my capacity as acting dean and in my role as a disability rights uh, scholar and, and activist, uh, is is really very special for me. Uh, when we look at the ADA, as I think we'll hear over the course of the day, I think uh, this is a uh, perhaps a mixed story, a very positive story in many ways in terms of the role that advocates played and, and lawyers played in getting it enacted, some wonderful achievements under the statute, but also some ways in which the statute has not necessarily delivered, or in other ways that notwithstanding what the statute might provide, there are other needs both legally and otherwise that have to be addressed for people with disabilities. Uh, and so as we go through the day, this is not going to be, it, it will be a celebration, but it will also be, I think, a critical look at ways in which the ADA can be improved or needs to be supplemented with other legislation and efforts that go beyond what the law can do and relate to what advocates and uh, self-advocates and their allies can do to enforce the rights that the ADA uh, uh, seeks to enforce. So with that, uh, we're going to turn it over. I think we have a video presentation and uh, we welcome you. And, and uh, finally, I guess I should say that I'm very pleased in seeing the participants that we have a number of graduates of the law school, um, some of whom um, I had the pleasure to teach. Uh, and it's great to see you on in addition to the current students who are on this, uh, on this webinar. So thank you. Life totally changes when you have something like the onset of a disability. That's the wonderful thing about what technology has allowed me to do, because I could not be here talking about this right now if it wasn't for these assistive technologies to put me back to work. When we design technologies that don't work for everyone, we really are creating a segmented society. And early on in my career, I realized there are some people who can't use the toys and tools that I love to use. And that drove me down the path towards democratizing our technology. We wanted to have a safe and approachable space where employees could come and learn and ask questions about accessibility. It's the ultimate creative challenge. It gets teams to step outside their own experience and think about how all different types of users might be experiencing the product that they're building. When you come into our labs, you can use a single switch. You can test out those technologies on mobile devices. A person who is blind, someone who can only move one finger, can still have full access to all types of technology. You can use a head mouse, so you can control your cursor just by moving your head around. These kinds of experiences really show our developers what it's like to have a different way of using technology and how they can build better. We're starting out at the very beginning. We run user studies because our developers and engineers, they want to hear from real people. If I have users that can't activate a particular button on a screen because it's too close to something else, I have to work with the team to have them change that. There's this concept called an electronic curb cut. The notion is when curb cuts were first put onto street corners, it was for people in wheelchairs. Over time, it became really obvious it was useful for everyone. When we create, for instance, closed captions on a video, we know our initial stakeholders are people who are deaf or hard of hearing. We also know that people who are watching in noisy environments are benefiting greatly from closed captions. Good design is accessible design. Accessible design is good design. If we can get to the point where our products are all born accessible, activate Yahoo Finance and stay accessible, we will have accomplished our mission. So with that, uh, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Zachary Bastian here representing the event sponsor Verizon. Uh, it is truly a privilege for Verizon to be part of this event today. On a personal note, I've been working with uh, Fernando LaGuarda for many years now. Uh, he was a mentor and a friend in my first job at Time Warner Cable, where he really introduced me to accessibility as a civil right. So it's a true pleasure to collaborate with him on this. And thank you so much to the staff and students at American University College of Law and the School on Law, Law and Government for a really superlative job putting together this event. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today. So as you saw from the video that we just played, uh, Verizon as a company is deeply invested in accessibility. 
when it comes to the accessibility of our products and services, and when it comes to really advancing these issues on a global scale. Uh, I was very excited to see recently that our CEO, Hans Vesberg, uh, publicly committed to join the Valuable 500, which is a global initiative publicly committing to business leadership through disability inclusion. Uh, we're really excited about that and a lot of other corporate initiatives that Verizon has invested in to advance the rights of people with, people with disabilities. And in fact, many of the speakers that you'll hear from today are our friends and stakeholders. Advocates on disability rights that we rely on for frank expert feedback on projects large and small. These are people that I call on a regular basis to get unvarnished information about where we're measuring up, where we can do better, and the policy issues that really drive concerns within this space. So to take all the hard work and ambition of our stakeholders into real policy, uh, we rely on policymakers who understand that accessibility is a civil right. And that's why it's such a pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable Senator from Massachusetts, Senator Edward Markey. Since 1976, Senator Markey has served in both the House of Representatives and the Senate with distinction, leading on numerous issues, including jobs, health care, and climate change. But today we're going to focus on his commitment to accessibility. Uh, a fierce and fervent supporter of the Americans with Disabilities Act, he introduced the 21st Century Communications Video and Accessibility Act, or CVAA, uh, and signed into law by 2010 by President Barack Obama. Now, this legislation, which was supported by Verizon, made great strides to make today's technologies more accessible. Senator Markey did this because he's committed to equal access to video, an issue every more, ever more critical in today's remote learning environment. He introduced the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act last October to ensure proper educational accommodations for students who are deaf, hard of hearing, blind, visually impaired, or deafblind. Senator Markey as well has fought attempts to strip the ADA of key provision, provisions opposing legislation that would add a notice period, allowing places of public accommodation to delay and avoid ba basic access. And also Verizon sends its congratulations to Senator Markey on winning his primary. He's been an excellent representative and Senator from Massachusetts, and we look forward to him continuing to work in that capacity. So for those reasons and many more, I am honored to welcome Senator Edward Markey. Hi, I'm Senator Ed Markey from Massachusetts. And while I wish we could be together in person today, I'm delighted to virtually participate in this celebration of a remarkable milestone, the 30th anniversary of the American with Disabilities Act. My thanks to American University for bringing everyone together. 30 years ago, the Americans with Disabilities Act became the law of the land. We fought for this essential legislation because we all know that ADA also stands for all deserve access. The ADA is a cornerstone of our country's commitment to its highest ideals, equality of opportunity, equal rights, and freedom to pursue your dreams. In Congress, I have been honored to work to protect and advocate for the rights of Americans with disabilities. For almost four decades, I have led a series of legislative initiatives aimed at broadening access to technologies that can help individuals with disabilities do things that most Americans take for granted. In 1982, I worked to pass the Telecommunications Act for the disabled. This law required that essential telephones be hearing aid compatible. In 1988, I worked to pass the Hearing Aid Compatibility Act, which required that most telephones manufactured or imported into the United States be compatible with hearing aids. That same year, I also passed the Telecommunications Accessibility Enhancement Act, a law that required the government to ensure that communications with and within the federal agencies were accessible to people with hearing and speech disabilities. Then in 1990, Congress passed the landmark Americans with Disabilities Act. As we now know, the ADA was truly an historic victory. As chairman of the Telecommunications Subcommittee in the House of Representatives, I made sure that the ADA also established a nationwide telecommunications relay service, which now ensures that people who are deaf, hard of hearing, or have speech disabilities can make telephone calls like everyone else. And our work 
did not end with the ADA. In 1996, we passed another law I authored, the Telecommunications Act. This enormous legislation included several accessibility provisions. And then in 2010, I was proud to write a capstone law that represents the culmination of all of these efforts, the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, or CVAA. Just like the ADA mandated physical ramps onto buildings, the CVAA required online ramps to the internet so that individuals with disabilities can access the web from wherever they happen to be. Passing this legislation was truly a revolutionary achievement, and it remains one of my proudest achievements. I believe accessibility is about participation. And when we expand the circle of inclusion, we evolve as a people. So as we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the ADA, I want to reaffirm my commitment to this continuing mission. Together, we will ensure that the ADA continues to fulfill its promise and that we can build on this remarkable law into the future. Thank you all for all you do to ensure that accessibility is a cornerstone of America. One of the greatest misconceptions about people with disabilities is that they're going to be high maintenance employees. I know from experience that that's just not true. When you hire someone with a disability or someone from a marginalized group, you're hiring someone who is a hard worker, who is determined, who is going to come up with the best possible solution against all odds and look at it from a perspective that no one else understands. Having a hearing loss is, a, is an asset for a lot of employers because oftentimes deaf people are not distracted by sounds in the office. They're not distracted by the water cooler discussions. They see the world through their eyes. They hear the world through their eyes and they're just focused on getting the job done. We're known for being innovative and creative because we're used to the world not always being accessible to us, so we have to improvise and come up with our own solutions. There are some traits that I've seen that are common across every person with a disability, regardless of what that disability is. And the primary characteristic is resilience, uh, a thing that I think all employers value, and I think lawyers in particular put a significant premium on. I use several strategies. One is that I over-prepare. I also have to commit legal arguments to memory. You know, if, I have to, if I'm going to court and, and I have to argue a motion, I can't rely on my vision, you know, to look down and read a paper while the judge is asking me a question. I need to think ahead of time, go into the courtrooms ahead of time, look at the layout, look at the little things. Like, is there a little ledge at the bottom of the podium stand? So when I put my papers on it, they're not gonna fall on the ground. There are many cases where I've actually seen people with disabilities have a particular strength that makes them uniquely better at what they do. My superpower makes me unique because I'm able to see the world very differently than the average individual. And that is a tool that can be used in various ways. It can help with being able to empathize with other people. I also think that it allows me to have more creative ideas for problem solving. When you do indigent criminal defense, you're probably running through about 20 different people's names, cases, pleas. And so I've actually found that the fact that my brain transitions quickly between things has set me up really well to not get flustered as easily. Having a hearing loss forces me to hyper-focus on what the client is saying or what the opposing side is saying or what the judge is saying. For me, I became a lawyer because of my disability. What I realized was litigation was probably the best form of mental competition that I could think of. Given the right resources and tools, persons with disabilities can overcome anything. Giving an accommodation does not mean that you lower your expectations of them. Being very clear and explicit on what the expectations are, you can get to the same solution many different ways. One of the most important impacts that hiring people with disabilities has is improving your culture as a workplace. Having a, an attorney who has a disability adds a different viewpoint and a different life experience to your law firm. One of the things that's missing in our conversation in the legal community is how large the population is that, that we serve that have disabilities. Hiring lawyers who have disabilities shouldn't be seen as a tokenizing move. It should be something that you're doing because you're trying to make your firm and 
your legal community and the community broader a more equitable, inclusive, and better place. My recommendation would be one, start recruiting. There are networks out there that you can tap into and hire someone. Educate yourself and their supervisors about the nature of the disability, the potential of the individual, and then work with them accommodate them and be as inclusive as possible. A lot of times working across difference can feel uncomfortable. Lean into that discomfort. I promise you, you will grow from that experience. There's nothing that can stop a person with a disability when they set their mind to do something because they've already overcome the hardest part. Stand next to, with, and for people with disabilities seen and unseen. We belong to each other. That was terrific. Um, so the next um, video we have is uh, of a interview that I, uh, or a conversation really, that I conducted with Ricardo Thornton and Donna Thornton, his wife, uh, a few days ago. And in it, we talked a little bit about their experiences having uh, grown up in a institution outside of Washington, DC, the uh, Forest Haven, which has long since been closed. And ask, I asked them what the ADA might, meant to them and what they'd like to see going forward. Uh, re, both Ricardo and Donna have had ex, dis, uh, extinguished, uh, extinct, distinguished careers uh, as av advocates in so many ways, um, in, and uh, including in a very important uh, self-advocacy organization here in Washington, Project Advocacy. Uh, they really are extraordinary uh, people and friends, and we hope you enjoy this uh, interview that uh, that we did. Uh, well, Ricardo and Donna, it's great to see you both uh, uh, and on this Zoom call. And what we're going to do today is just have a little conversation about the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, as you guys know, this is the 30th year of the ADA. It's really hard to believe, Yay! but it got passed in 1990, and and it has had. And this conference is about uh, knowing what the ADA has done for people, but also what it needs to do going forward. So just a little bit of uh, background for our audience. Um, uh, the two of you were at Forest Haven, the institution mm -hmm. for people with intellectual disability, which we all are very happy to say is now closed. In mm -hmm. fact, it closed, mm -hmm. I believe, 1991, the year after the ADA was passed. Uh, but could you give us just a little bit of what your story was, uh, You know, how you met, what happened after you were there, and, and uh, then we'll go on from there, just so people know who you are. Yeah, uh, I met um, my wife there. She was a, she was my friend at first. Her name was Donna, and um, the institution I lived in, we didn't have decision making. We didn't have those things. We had people that made decisions for us, not ourselves. We had to uh, just obey and follow the rules, and um, we won't get in trouble. Mm -hmm. There are times where we did get in trouble, mm -hmm. but. Um, some of the punishments were where we just locked up and um, what's, what's that place called? Hemlock? Hemlock. Mm -hmm. Hemlock, okay. Hemlock. Mm -hmm. That's where they put you in. It's just like jail. It's just like they have bars. They have... My sister lived in um, Hemlock and mm -hmm. I had an older sister named Earlene Thornton. Mm -hmm. And Earlene lived down there and along with some of the other ladies. Unfortunately, she passed there. Mm -hmm. And at the time she passed, I wanted to advocate that no one have to live like she lived mm -hmm. and suffer the way she suffered with medication over and over and over. Mm -hmm. So I want to advocate for change. And that was one of my strongest advocates. Right, honey? Yes. But I met Donna. I met you at, I met you at Forest Haven and yes. you got out. And yeah. And, and when did you, uh, Donna, when did you leave Forest Haven? Do you remember what I you... left in, I forgot what uh -huh. year. In the 1980s, was it? So, like the 1978. 78. Seven. Was it after the lawsuit was filed? After the, after the law, yeah. Okay, yeah. so Evans was filed, I think, in 1976. So sometime after that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you moved into the community, right? You were in I the moved in the community. I worked, I worked in the community a while. And then... Um, and then I liked it. I liked to work in the community. Mm -hmm. I used to, I worked in McDonald's uh -huh. for a while. And then my then my boyfriend, he worked in the community for a while mm -hmm. in McDonald's. And he want he wanted to go to school. And I said, What why you want to go to school? 
And then after that, I asked him, I asked him, I said, okay, if you want to go to school, you go back to school and I'll keep on walking. Now that's 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 a good partner, right? <laughs> yeah. But the good thing was she finally got a partner of her own. Yeah, I, I got and, went um, out and and they told me uh, that I could I went out and got my own a place. Wow. And she yeah. had a boyfriend come to visit her. Yeah. And that's when she proposed. I proposed. Okay. All right, a woman who knows her own mind. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Yep, I proposed to him, and I asked him to marry me, and he married me. She asked him, what I, what I, uh, she said, uh, what if we were to get married? Because you come over and visit me, and um, I like what you're doing, and I, you know, I really like that. So she wanted to get married. I said, I wasn't going to get married until I'm about 65. By that time, nobody, <laughs> she said, by that time, nobody going to want my ass. So. Yeah. yeah. But, uh <laughs> <laughs> but we did, we did, we went through the process. We went and asked our case managers and tried to get their thoughts on it. And they were against it. Yeah, they were very they were not against for it. it. Yeah. You wonder why you want to do, why you want to go mess up a good thing. The yeah. institution is closing. Okay, people are now going into group home, going into the part, group homes and establishing new uh, home sets. And you all talking about marriage. So. And I asked them, I said, well, you know, y'all got, you know, I told him, I said, y'all got what we don't want. We don't have. Y'all married. Y'all have a car. And y'all free. So why can't we have it? Right, right. Absolutely. You know, we want what you want. want the same thing y'all have. Right. Absolutely. Right. So you got married. Uh, got you, had, married. you had a son, Ricky Jr. Got a son. Mm -hmm. He was two yes. pounds, 11 ounces. Now he got... Some family. My son got a family. He got two girls, two girls named Leah, Maria, and a, a boy. A stepson. A stepson. His name is Daniel. And he has autism. And oh, he oh. got autism. And my little girls, he they they Leah, Maria, and they five and six years old. I mm -hmm. think six. Are eight years old, five and six, eight years old. The okay. daughter's a happy, you know, she's a happy parent, but you know, I'm always reminded of telling, I always tell the story when I go to uh, meetings, and that is mm -hmm. when she had her baby and they, um, <laughs> they asked me to come to the hospital because they, this was supposed to be a routine checkup and it wound up being that they were going to get the baby. Oh, oh. and um, they, Went and got the baby, and I told her I could not get there right away because I had a basketball game. Oh. I did. I'm sorry. Yeah. But uh, 60 Minutes was at the hospital. Oh, It was yeah. actually filming this. So uh, yeah. I actually came to the hospital. But I'm always reminded when Donna talked with the doctors, her and the doctor, when the baby came, it was 2 pounds, 11 ounce, all excitement about this beautiful baby. Yeah. But uh, the question came that Donna asked the doctor was, will my baby love me? And the doctor said, yes. Does he have all his hands, his feet? But yeah. the thing I always remind people is, to, as you take a moment to pause, will my baby love me? Yeah, yeah. When you think about that, um, peace. the work that you're going to have to do to be a good parent. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember, Ricardo, when, uh, so uh, we should tell the folks that uh, you and I and, and, and Donna, we've known yes. you for a long time. And we were both on the original Quality Trust uh, of indi with Individuals with Disabilities board. Mm -hmm. And Don is now on the board. So it's been a family affair for you guys. Yeah. Uh, and I remember conversations we had about, you know, teaching your son how to drive, teaching my son how to drive. And, and uh, mm -hmm. that's been, that was one of the fun kinds of things we were able to, to share over time. Um, and you guys, uh, you know, again, uh, as our audience may not know, uh, you know, not, you mentioned 60 Minutes, you've been on 60 Minutes, you had a movie made about you called yeah, Profoundly I mean, Normal uh, with Delroy yeah, Lindo yeah. and Kirstie Alley playing both of you. Uh, and of course, Ricardo, you've been an extraordinary Special Olympics athlete and have traveled all around the world for Special Olympics. Uh, you're yeah. also in the National History Museum for your Special Olympics. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm honored to be in your presence. You're, <laughs> you're both such famous people. Thank you. Thank you. So, so let me ask you this. 
um, this is, as again, we know it's the 30th anniversary of the ADA. If you had to put it in your own words, what do you think the ADA has meant to people with disabilities, particularly people with intellectual disability, and, and to you personally, is that something that has mattered to you guys? I think the ADA has opened up a lot of doors and opportunities. One of the biggest doors that opened for me was that I get to make decisions, I get to choose, and I get to live finally in an independent living, um, which is a house now, we're in a house where we have walking supervision, Mm -hmm. So we get to cook and uh, we don't have a lot of uh, staff cooking for us. We try to be as independent as we can. Mm -hmm. And I like that. Yeah. yeah. So the ADA has opened up a lot of doors, especially in this, in this area and the other doors, employment. Mm -hmm. I'm working at the library going on my 40, 42 40 years, years. Wow. in November. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Got it through special ed. So I'm trying to keep special ed, know, let people know in special ed that are going there or still in special ed, special ed to understand that it's because you're in special ed does not mean that you're not going to achieve goals. Right. You take a look at what I've done. You can do the same. Yeah. And, and folks should know the library that you've worked at for so many years is the Martin Luther King Jr. Library, which has just mm -hmm. been renovated. Right. So it's it's a, a nice new. Oh, it's place. beautiful. You got to check it out, Bob. I have, have, have to get down out. there. Yeah. 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 And Donna, what about you? What would you say? That well, I do act like as, as more like I'm a house person. I retired, and now I I don't do nothing. But <laughs> you stand by your husband. I yeah. stay around my husband. Yeah. You keep him honest, which is a tough <laughs> job. Yeah. That's, that's a tough. That's a tough job. Yeah. Um, you know, so one of the things that I know um, is important to to both of you uh, and to people in the self advocacy movement is to get people out of institutions, just like yes. you got out. Yeah. Uh, and as you probably know, um, in uh, in 1999, the Supreme Court decided a case called the Olmstead case, uh, and I, I you probably know about that case, and that's the case that many people have used to get people out of institutions. So even though Forest Haven closed in 1991, we still have too many people in institutions yes. in the country. Yeah. And, you know, I think your point, Ricardo, about, um, you know, that they don't get to make choices about what, about what they want. Yeah. Uh, and, yes. and so it's so important to be able to be in a situation where, you know, where you get to retire and I'm sure you do more than nothing, Donna, but but if you want to do nothing, you know, you're entitled <laughs> yeah, to do that. Yeah. You know, she has, she's been traveling a lot. Uh, matter of fact, she's been to Connecticut, uh -huh. Austin, where she's told her story as we're talking to you all today. And yeah. she's been yeah. to, um, where are we, Montana. Montana, yeah. Oh, and okay. uh, to celebrate the ADA, they had down there, I think that was, what, two years ago? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she's been doing a little bit of traveling. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. ever since the COVID, we kind of slowed down a little bit, but we still want to keep. Yeah, COVID is really, you know, affecting everybody. And there's a lot less, uh, I, you know, you mentioned your grandchildren. I've got two uh, myself and I've not been able to see them in person. And that's, you know, that's tough because you want to. Luckily, we do things like this. You know, we're on we're on the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, one of the things, one of the. Uh, uh, State, one of the phrases about the disability rights movement, as you know, is nothing about us without us. Not I us. think that's another thing about being able to make your decisions. Yeah. Um, and yeah. we also know, you know, when we make decisions, some of them are good ones, some of them are not, and we hope to learn from them. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's yeah. also important. So let me ask this, um, going forward, what would, like if you had to, if you had a crystal ball in front of you, what would you like to see happen uh, in terms of the way uh, society treats people with disabilities going forward. So if we were trying to look in the future. <clears throat> I would like, I would, if, this, if they were to treat people with disabilities with a lot more respect, open up more doors, jobs, yeah. opportunities. Mm -hmm. And that's where about the disability. It's not disability, it's the ability that they have within. Right. And let them use and show and be willing to teach them mm -hmm. as they move forward. Yeah. That would be beautiful. And yeah. let them live independence. And yeah, give no, them I think more that's... freedom. Give them more freedom. More freedom, and I, and I know you earlier. You know, both of you have worked for many years, and of course, we also know that for a lot of people with intellectual disability, they haven't been able to work in the community. They've had to work in sheltered workshops, which are yeah. you know not the same as working at McDonald's or the yeah. the King Junior Library. And then knowing that assistance, if they need it, assistance is there. So having more rehab councils to make sure that they really fill in on yeah. employment for them. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, that's one of the other things we know that everybody needs help. The big question yeah. is, is, is it help you ask for, or is it help that someone just thinks they're going to give to you? Ooh, yeah, ooh, Bob, I like that. One. Like that one? Okay. I like that. One. <laughs> okay. Because, you know, when living in an institution, we had, um, jobs down at the institution where we went to work like at some work that's like school. a training job yeah, yeah. and you got yeah. a stipend you only got like fifteen dollars yeah and yeah. on friday that's a lot of money to people who had never worked yeah yeah well i remember also when you know during the evans case one of the big things that people who had been at the institution wanted they wanted their back pay because you guys had that's right pay. yeah that's right and we you know the organization the quality trust helped create the uh the vinner trust for wesley yeah. vinner right to put money in the trust so that people could have it. And right. you know, I think, again, I think some people were surprised that that was so important to the people in the class. But you know, again, as we said earlier, you want what other people want. If you work, you should get yeah. money that you, that you earn for them. Yes. Yeah. Well, listen, this has been great. And uh, it's going to be, as you know, part of the uh, all day, uh, well, the two hour conference on uh, October 27th. So we will have an edited version of this, uh, this uh, interview. And you'll be, and I'll, I'll get with you, and you'll be able to, to uh, come on to that, uh, that day to watch it if, if you're interested, if you have time. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. Well, thank you guys both. It's always great thank to you, see Bob. you. Donna, you're keep giving him, keep giving him a hard time. You know? <laughs> I will. Okay. I know you will. All right. It's great to see you guys. Okay. Bob. Okay. Bye. -bye. bye. The faces you see in your day-to-day -day life ultimately define your perspective on what's normal. What you're frequently seeing is this idea of disabled as lesser, disabled as something that needs to be fixed. I don't need to be fixed from what I am. I just want to be included, and I think that we all do. People with disabilities make up about 20% of the population, but only 2% of our media. Let's change that. Okay, let's go. Verizon, the disability community, and Getty Images are creating a new photo collection that more accurately reflects the lives and diversity of people with disabilities. We can do anything, and it requires the media to help get that message out. Let's change how the world sees disability. <laughs> Thank you. Get started at thedisabilitycollection.com. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Thank you for investing your time with us today. My name is Angela Garretts and I'm the Vice President of the Disability Law Society here at American University WCL. And I'm honored to be introducing our amazing panelists. Um, today's panel will cover what the ADA has accomplished so far, how activists helped to push for the ADA, uh, how they continue to advocate and how we can all move forward to improve on and add to the foundations of the ADA. Uh, now to take a very brief look at our fantastic panelists' careers. Uh, in no particular order, we have uh, Judy Human. Uh, she is currently an international disability rights advocate. Um, she holds a bachelor's from Long Island University and a master's of public health from the University of California at Berkeley. Among her many advocacy accomplishments, she co-founded Disabled in Action, uh, led the 1977 Section 504 sit-ins, and served as special advisor for international disability rights uh, in the Obama administration, and assistant secretary for special education and rehabilitative services in the Clinton administration. Um, next, we have Lydia Brown. Um, who is currently policy counsel for the Privacy and Data Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology, focusing on disability rights and algorithmic fairness and justice. Uh, they hold a bachelor's from Georgetown and a JD from Northeastern University. They are the editor of All the Weight of Our Dreams on Living Radicalized Autism, uh, published by the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. Um, is a founding board member of Alliance for Citizen Directed Supports, and will be teaching a one credit uh, course on AU's main campus in the spring semester entitled Disability and Race, Laws and Legacies. 
Um, we also have with us today Carrie Gray, um, who is a Senior Director of Stakeholder Engagement and Strategic Communications with the American Association of People with Disabilities. She holds a BA and a Master of Arts in Communications from Abilene Christian University. Um, she previously was the Director of Next Gen Initiatives at Disability Inn, where she created programs for young professionals in the private sector, working with the National Council on Independent Living, uh, working with numerous companies and institutions of higher education to create those varied opportunities. Um, we also have with us uh, Zainab um, Alkebsi. She is currently policy counsel with the National Association for the Deaf. Um, she holds a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Maryland and a JD from University of Baltimore. Um, she served as a deputy director at Maryland's Governor's Office of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, uh, where she coordinated legislative and policy efforts. Um, we also have Deepa Goraya. She currently is a public rights project fellow with the Delaware Attorney General's Office, holds a bachelor's from UCLA and a JD from the University of Michigan, and previously uh, served as the civil rights and disability rights attorney with Disability Rights Maryland, focusing on Medicaid and healthcare issues for clients seeking support services. Uh, before that, she also served as associate counsel at Washington's Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs, challenging violations of the ADA among other violations. Um, and some of her specific successes include working to increase accessibility for blind customers and students uh, with online systems for places like Sweet Green and Barbary Bar Prep, um, as well as direct representation for employees with uh, employment discrimination claims under the ADA. Um, and of course, we also have our moderator for today's panel, uh, Acting Dean uh, Robert Dinnerstein, uh, Dean Dinnerstein. Thank you, Angela. Um, and uh, uh, this is terrific. So the last part of our program uh, is going to be uh, uh, a panel, as you as you know, introduced by Angela. And we're going to our, our format is going to be that I'm going to ask uh, the panelists some questions. Some will be directed at uh, particular panelists, at least to, to begin. But I'm also going to encourage panelists to to jump in uh, after the initial speaker if they have something they wish to add uh, to that. So our first question is for Judy Human. Um, and again, we. Uh, in addition to all the things you said about Judy, there are many other things, including that she has a new book out. But I think the favorite thing is that she's uh, the subject of a drunk history show um, uh, about her experiences, which uh, which is terrific if you have a chance to see that. But Judy, um, uh, you are such an important figure in the disability rights movement. Um, and I'd like to ask you a little bit about the history of the ADA and the lessons we can draw upon uh, the ADA's enactment. So uh, after the years of advocacy that preceded the ADA, uh, what made it happen? How did it come about? Uh, and in particular, how did activists, uh, non-lawyers, uh, push the issue so that the ADA could become a reality? Thank you very much. And it's great to be involved with this panel with so many great speakers. And the interview with um, Ricardo and Donna was really wonderful. Okay. Thank you for doing that. Um, I would say that it's important to recognize that what we've been seeing over the last number of decades is an increase in the voices of disabled individuals who have started well, started out really, I think, in, in larger degrees after the Second World War, when disabled veterans came home and many of them had more severe disabilities or significant disabilities than previously and were being cut out of um, the communities that they had been very actively involved with. And so when we look at groups like P Paralyzed Veterans of America and GAV and other groups, you can really start seeing that um, people speaking up and out about themselves and wanting to be able to be a part of society, I think is an important part of our history that we don't necessarily really look at. And I think it's also very fair to say that the advent of television and its ability to bring the activism that was growing across the United States and internationally, looking at the development um, of the civil rights movement and really being able to learn more about 
how people were putting their lives on the line, fighting for discriminate against discrimination. And uh, for me, it was also looking at different groups that were involved, the role of government, the role that government appropriately did or didn't play, the pain that people were going through in fighting for integration, et cetera. Uh, those I think were all very important aspects for um, myself and other people in my generation. And um, what we continued to see was the absence of our voices. This film that you mentioned earlier, you know, Crip Camp, um, is very important uh, piece, I think, of our uh, looking historically at what was happening, because you really, through this film, see the voices of younger disabled people who really were beginning to um, look at what futures we felt laid ahead for us and uh, what we felt was wrong and what we felt needed to be done. And I think really the ability to discuss issues of discrimination, which certainly in my generation was something that wasn't automatically discussed. You started hearing issues around the de uh, deinstitutionalization, you know, work that Stan Hare was doing and work that Tom Gilhool and Frank Lasky and others were doing. Um, that was, I think, quite monumental in really, I think, also broadening the disability rights movement to really look at the abrogation of rights, at, but very importantly, disabled individuals speaking up for ourselves. You know, you had groups like the National Association of the Deaf and National Federation of the Blind and American Council of the Blind, and um, then the creation of the Centers for Independent Living, which really were kind of unique because um, they were community-based organizations that were trying to become cross-disability. I think it's really important to recognize that cross-disability was something that really wasn't happening so much of what was going on at that point in time was really focused on medical cure. And I would say the biggest thing that people saw were the Jerry Lewis telethon, the United Cerebral Palsy telethon, socialites raising money, all very much for cure, science, research. And then you saw this emerging group of disabled individuals who wanted equality, wanted to be able to go to integrated schools, wanted to be able to get an education, wanted to be able to travel on the bus, on the train, wanted to be able to get jobs. And um, I think that's really a lot of what was happening at that time is as more disabled people were really coming together in many different ways um, in communities around the United States. So I would say disabled student services offices were very important because this ability to gather because we'd been so separated. Um, the ability to gather and articulate the pain that we were feeling, but really turning it into what did we want our futures to look like? And so when you look at activities like um, the 504 regulations and the battle that went on to get those regulations signed, you know, there were very monumental things that were happening the establishment of the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities in 1975, which unfortunately died about seven years later, but really was the first cross-disability organization where the leadership was in the hands of people with various forms of disabilities. Um, I think that activity really ultimately getting the 504 regulations signed uh, was a real victory. And I think people felt very empowered around that. Uh, likewise, the technical assistance money that the federal government put into um, enabling disabled people to come together to really learn about what 504 was, which was replicated again after the ADA was signed. But this ability come together, learn together, learn about what others were doing. I think also, you know, with the 504 activities, like with the work that went on in the 80s through the ADA and till today, really um, a growing form of formal and informal coalitions with groups that were not specifically focusing on disability. So, you know, working locally in the Bay Area, we were doing work with local healthcare clinics that were dealing in the Latino community, Black community, Asian communities, et cetera, and working on 
many different things, budgeting with the county, budgeting with the cities, fighting with the state. So a lot of this learning was going on and we were learning about the value of working together, supporting each other in multiple ways. So I, I really think that that historical perspective is very important. What was going on also at that time um, was the beginning of not only looking at cross disability, but also looking at issues around race and disability. And um, in the 70s, you see leaders like Don Galloway, um, uh, Deirdre Davis, and others who are beginning to come forward in their different communities, but also ultimately through groups like the National Council on Independent Living and others really beginning to talk about the disparities that were going on in communities of color. Um, and I think in many ways, it was really a learning experience for different communities. Um, so I think that's been something that really has been developing in a very positive way over the last couple of decades. And certainly the Black Lives Matter movement, the Black Disabled Lives Matter movement and others are really moving us to a different level. Thank you, Judy. That's a great introduction to a complicated uh, history, but I think you've set it out very well for some of the uh, some of the concerns uh, that that motivated the folks at that time, and that continue to be to be important ones today. So I'd like to to jump now to uh, current circumstances, um, and in particular, as reflected in this webinar, being uh, remote uh, the way it is, uh, the COVID pandemic. So, um, like the I'm going to ask. Uh, Lydia and Zainab to answer this question. Uh, can you tell us how COVID-19 pandemic has affected access to care and communications during this period for people with disabilities? How does it pose unique challenge for, for folks and how does the ADA help to address this? And insofar as it doesn't help, how could it be improved? Uh, so Lydia, when I start with you. This is Lydia. Thank you so much for that question, Robert. For me, when I think about the pandemic and disabled people, the first thing where my thoughts go, like for many of us, is in fears about care rationing that have been realized for many people. And what I mean by that, for those who are less familiar and are not sure what I'm talking about, I'm talking about hospital policies and some state policies that came to light over the last seven months that dictated a procedure for hospitals to follow when there are limited resources like ventilators or limited medical personnel available or limited beds in an ICU. And what would happen if enough people were sick with COVID that the hospital had to make choices about who would receive a ventilator, who would receive a bed, who would receive care, who would not. And many of those policies included provisions that people with certain kinds of disabilities might be precluded from receiving care, might be deprioritized or removed from the list altogether because of assumptions about quality of life, because of assumptions about survivability, and because of assumptions about which people's lives are worth living and which people's lives are worth saving. And we saw in one very highly publicized case over the summer of Michael Hickson, who is a Black disabled man in Texas, who went to the hospital to seek treatment for COVID and was turned away specifically because he was disabled and undoubtedly also because he was black. And what happened to Michael Hickson, unfortunately is not an anomaly or a rarity. Throughout our history in the United States, people with disabilities have always been deemed as expendable or disposable. And how this plays out under disability law is that we're supposed to be protected. The ADA affirms a right to non-discrimination, to equal opportunity, equality of access, equality of opportunity. However, we have other laws on the books that enshrine inequality. Section 14C of the Fair Labor Standards Act that still allows for payment of subminimum wage. Laws throughout the US that allow for payment of subminimum wage to incarcerated people who are all majority disabled, and in some cases, pure extraction of forced labor without any pay or compensation at all from incarcerated people. And in all of these ways, we see that whether it is in the healthcare setting, as under the pandemic now, or in employment, that disabled people are considered less valuable and less worthy. 
And the ADA offers us the opportunity to try to challenge those policies, for example, as Disability Rights Washington, Disability Rights California, and several other disability advocacy organizations have done so to challenge those care rationing policies. But they also remain in effect in our lives. And we just heard news the other day, it was a news article, that some doctors will be turning to make decisions about again, about COVID treatment, about care with limited beds in an ICU, and that perhaps this could involve algorithmic determinations, perhaps this could involve doctors making individual determinations, consultations with a bioethicist on staff, all of which for us as disabled people raise deep questions about how ableism, not to mention racism and other forms of oppression will play out because law and policy don't always reflect lived reality. The promise of the ADA of non-discrimination and of equality of opportunity of protecting us from the worst possible harms of discriminatory treatment has not been fulfilled. If that promise were fulfilled, Michael Hickson would be alive. If that promise had been fulfilled, we would not be having a conversation right now about limited healthcare supplies and personnel necessitating hospitals to decide who they think is worthy of care or who shouldn't be or who they predict is more likely to outlive COVID versus to succumb to it. And all of which are going to be predicated, of course, on data about our actual lives, that disabled people, especially disabled people of color, especially queer and trans disabled people, other disabled people at the margins of the margins are now and have always been subjected to shorter lifespans because of lack of quality healthcare, because of denial of treatment, because of discriminatory treatment, because of forced coercive or involuntary treatment or even medical experimentation. Even now in discussions with regard to the pandemic about a potential vaccine, the testing sites that have been proposed for the vaccine last I heard are New Mexico and Michigan, both states that have very large black populations and large native populations. And that to me also raises the specter of continued medical experimentation on communities that under ableism and white supremacy are deemed expendable and disposable, acceptable sacrifices or collateral damage. And that might sound like a lot of blow hard, but the statistics bear that out. That people with my disability, autistic people, on average die 30 years younger than average. And that doesn't account for disaggregation along racial lines, socioeconomic class, or gender. We already know that people with disabilities constitute a majority of people who are incarcerated and a majority of people who experience homelessness. And that homeless people likewise experience shorter lifespans that people who have been incarcerated experience shorter lifespans on average. And so when all those statistics collide, we see a reality where if doctors and hospitals and policymakers are thinking about how to respond to COVID after we already had a response that did not, that did not in fact, was not in fact effective, but also will not be able to serve all of us because that's why there's a conversation about limited supplies you know, it makes us wonder what will these statistics look like? How will that data be used to shape decisions that will further entrench those discriminatory patterns? How will that data be used to inform decisions, programs, or policies that will bring us farther away from the promise of the ADA rather than closer to fulfilling it? Thank you, Lydia. Zainab, same question for you. How would you uh, think about COVID and, and its effect on people with disabilities? I'm waiting for my interpreter to be ready. Okay, great. Thank you very much for having me here on this wonderful and informative panel. I have to agree that since the pandemic has turned the world upside down in every possible way, we have observed a lack, a concerning lack of access across many different contexts. A big barrier has been that many government press briefings were not accessible to deaf and hard of hearing people. 
And to address this issue, we at NAD had been advocating for ASL interpreters and accurate captioning in all broadcasts of such emergency briefings. We have received many complaints from deaf and hard of hearing people unable to understand from the briefings what they are supposed to do or avoid to stay safe and healthy. So to fill this void and to address new communication barriers that have arisen as a result of this pandemic, we have developed advocacy tools, which can be found at nad.org backslash coronavirus. We have also pursued lawsuits, such as against the White House for failing to provide ASL interpreters for the coronavirus press briefings. This is in the Rehab Act context. I still want to mention it because the federal judge in that case, ruling in our favor on a motion for a preliminary injunction, ordered the White House to provide AXL access for the first time ever. Now more specific to the ADA, we have also filed similar lawsuits against state governors, such as in Florida, so stay tuned. Also, there are challenges now with masks in every aspect of life and that has hindered communications for deaf and hard of hearing people. While we strongly support the need for masks, masks do make lip reading impossible and hide other important facial cues. This impacts communications in a wide variety of contexts. For example, if a deaf or hard of hearing person votes in person, communication can be an even bigger issue than usual at the polling place because everyone will be wearing masks. We released guidelines on mass communications and it's the same link as I mentioned, nad.org backslash coronavirus. Another barrier has been to telehealth and the failure to provide ASL interpreters and captioning on telehealth platforms due to so-called questions about the applicability of the ADA to telehealth contexts. We also developed guidelines on this issue, which can be found at the same link mentioned earlier. We need to resolve these questions and make clear that simply because the ADA was written before the internet was widespread, that does not mean that the internet is exempt from the ADA. It just means we need to redefine what the ADA means in a digital world. As for increased legal protections, I do not think the ADA should be touched legislatively. We have already had a few scares on the house regarding bills that aim to weaken the ADA rather than strengthen it under the guise of a nice sounding very misleading title. Instead, gaps should be addressed via regulatory and other means. For example, we have been waiting a long time for the web accessibility regulations. I hope to not be waiting too long. I hope 30 years from now to be reflecting again on the ADA and see greater strides realized in this generation. These are just some of the difficult issues we have encountered in trying to navigate the legal and technical dimensions of remote access for deaf and hard of hearing people in a pandemic induced virtual world. Thank you. Thank you, uh, both of you. Uh, very rich uh, answer to my question. And many things would be wonderful to follow up on, but I, I want to move us on uh, to the next question. Um, and I'm um, uh, going to start, going to direct this to Carrie, then Deepa, and then, and then to Lydia for, for this question. 
So uh, Lydia alluded to this in her answer to the previous question. BIPOC with disabilities endure unique challenges and experience discrimination even within the disability focused communities that, that we are discussing. So how can increased attention towards systemic racism and structural racism help build a more inclusive disability rights movement? Uh, how can organizations and individuals address implicit bias, generational trauma and other barriers that prevent people with disabilities who are also people of color from uh, getting uh, what is their due. So I'll start, Carrie, with you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I definitely wanna say thank you for having me and the American Association of People with Disabilities participate in today's event. Um, to get into this question, I think one, the fact that we are having to highlight um, the issues surrounding people of color in particular really shows the separation that's been going in our movements that has created a lot of negative impacts for people of color in particular. So what I mean by that is the idea that when we talk about disability rights in general, oftentimes it is with the assumption that we're going with the framework of the experiences of white people. And that has created a lot of issues because for instance, we are in the season of voting and we have a big election that is currently happening um, through next week, if not longer. And when we talk about disability rights and if we only address it in a way that is not inclusive of black indigenous people of color, um, then we're only talking about voting in the sense of voter inaccessibility. Um, which impacts a lot of people. Um, there's been a lot of accessible issues that have been happening, um, not just this year, but for, for, for decades um, um, in previous times. But what we don't talk about is voter suppression because voter suppression is an issue that is often seen as that's what they do in racial justice groups over there. <laughs> and so the consequences is that you might be taking some steps forward in terms of making sure that we're addressing disability rights, but we're not looking at it in a holistic way that is inclusive of all people of color. And in fact, this um, uh, disability prevalence is highest in communities of color. So if we're going to really be looking at the ways in which we're moving forward with the foundation of the ADA and then also for years to come, then it's critically important that we're looking at it from the experiences of folks who are at the margins, um, meaning disabled people of color, disabled trans folks, disabled queer folks, disabled women, like all of our intersections matter. In today's times, we are witnessing a historic uprising of the Black Lives Matter movement. And Black Lives Matter is not new, um, but in this year in 2020, we're seeing a historic uprising. And it has caused a lot of really necessary attention to the ways in which Black folks experience state violence, um, including Black disabled folks, right? And it's created this sense of urgency around how individuals and organizations' ability to not only understand racial justice, but to be a part of the solution. How can we act? How can we create change? How can we ensure that, again, our conversations that ultimately lead to our advocacies are not just through a framework of white folks, right? And so I think what's beautiful that we can learn from the Black Lives Matter movement is its creation under the underlying framework of intersectionality. So leaders in the movement intentionally getting up and saying that we are not just fighting for one type of Black person, but we are fighting for Black folks who are also LGBTQ, who are women, who are femme, who are trans, who are disabled, like they named it, right? And they saw like all of the stories and the narratives of what's happening in our community and attempted to create platforms and solutions that meet people at the margin. And I'm not trying to say that the movement is perfect, but I am trying to say that there is an example here of what we need to be doing when it comes to disability rights. I think the, the part that is important to mention is that um, people of color and particularly black people with disabilities are facing really systemic differences in their experiences. When we look at unemployment, for instance, we see that among people with disabilities, black people have a higher unemployment rate of around 11.8%. Um, and then when you get into other demographics, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And not to say, again, unemployment is the issue for everyone, but it is based upon also racial disparities that are occurring. And so I think regardless if you know the specific numbers, the statistics, the ways in which 
race and disability intersect and how it's impacting people, um, I think hopefully people understand um, that racial injustice very much intersects with disability. And we need to be thinking of solutions. We need to see opportunity in the ways in which we're discussing policies, programs, advocacies um, to ensure that we're looking at a new way of going about disability rights. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, Deepa, the same question for you. Thanks, Bob. Um, and I'm really grateful to be on this panel along with all these brilliant speakers. So thank you so much. Um, I, going along with what Carrie said, which I completely agree with, um, I, I think we need to ensure that disability, we have to stop treating disability rights as separate from civil rights. We have to uh, make sure that disability rights is included in all civil rights advocacy, all civil rights legal work, um, and stop treating it as something separate. Um, you know, there's civil rights issues overlap in every way with disability rights issues and vice versa. So, you know, when we see housing discrimination, it affects a large number of people with disabilities. When we see employment discrimination, it affects so many people with disabilities. Um, and, you know, 70% of the blind population is still unemployed. And there's still a very high unemployment rate for the disability community in general. And that's largely due to employment discrimination, implicit bias, uh, prejudices, et cetera. Um, and so we really need to stop uh, treating disability rights as something separate. And going along with that, we need to bring intersection intersectionality across all our movements. We have to not have a separate, for example, a Black Lives Matter movement and disabled Black Lives Matter movement. It should be one. And Carrie highlighted that. And you know, it, it should. We have to do that across all our advocacy movements, all our grassroots movements. Um, talking about voter access, for example. It doesn't just voter voter access um, and and voter suppression not only impact people of color but disabled people of color, disabled people in general. Um, you know, like I can't tell you how many times I've come across. You know, I, even in my current workplace, we were talking about voter protection issues, and um, and and just every person I meet, we're talking about voter protection, voter suppression, and and I say, well, what about blind people? How do we access? Uh, vote by mail ballots and you know and the blind um, community has had to file litigation about that um, you know access to the mail-in ballot because it's never been thought of or it hasn't been thought of or it's been an afterthought and then they have to scramble to ensure that blind people can have access to the ballot and so but that 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 should not be an afterthought it should be incorporated into all uh you know campaigns all you know voter protection issues um and same with um, same with you know accessibility issues, digital accessibility. In this time of COVID, um, we we have to make sure that technologies are accessible to everyone. And we have been fighting the disability community, especially you know I'm part of the blind community, so I can speak about the blind. We've been pushing for digital accessibility forever, and it's and now more than ever it's it's more important. And we're realizing. The effects of non uh, non inclusiveness, you know, like why if 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 everything had been made accessible a long time ago, we wouldn't have to worry about this right now. But we're still worrying about uh, digital um, accessibility of digital platforms, accessibility of testing systems, like taking the bar exam, for example. How do we get equal access to taking the bar exam virtually? Um, and luckily, Zoom is accessible, but there's many platforms that are not accessible. Um, online learning, there's various various issues um, regarding that. Healthcare, um, digital healthcare, uh, you know, telehealth, and um, accessing healthcare through other mediums uh, virtually. It, it, there's so many platforms that are not accessible. So I, I think we need to stop thinking of disability rights as some separate issue. We really need to incorporate it into all civil rights. Um, and there's, you know, civil rights attorneys should not be just, oh, you're a civil rights attorney and you're a disability rights attorney. No, they should be one and the same. Like th those issues affect everyone across the board. Um, and regarding implicit bias, you know, addressing that, I think the first step to addressing that is acknowledging that it exists because so many organizations um, and, and um, people don't acknowledge that, yes, I may have an implicit bias or our employees might, might have an implicit bias. And once we acknowledge that it exists, I think we can address it better. And so 
first step would be to acknowledge it and then to maybe get um, people to come speak about it, um, finding ways to address it and, and learn about it. And, um, and then, you know, start uh, making your workplaces and communities um, that you're, whatever you're a part of more diverse and starting with, oh, when you're planning a panel, for example, like this panel, we really have to make sure we, we include people of color because um, we need to get everyone's perspective. We need to make sure we include people with disabilities. And that should not that should not just be a tokenism kind of thing. Oh, we should include this person of color just as a token, um, but it should be it should be considered valuable to include everyone's perspective. And regarding, you know, for, from the perspective of a legal profession, um, including people with disabilities and people of color is not just a tokenized um, good thing to do, but it's like if you're representing a community, a diverse community, you should have people from that community as your lawyers as well. You shouldn't just have clients from the community, but you need to have lawyers. The community that you serve should be the community that you reflect in the workplace as well, including in the legal profession. So um, I think acknowledging that implicit bias and addressing, consciously addressing it would be a, a first step. Thanks, Deepa. And um, Lydia, you've already touched on this. I wonder if you have any brief additional remarks because uh, we got some other questions as well, but I do want to give you a chance to respond to this one. This is Lydia. For me as a disabled person of color, I value making sure that we not only include, but that we center disabled people of color in all of the work that we are doing. And I say that because it's easy to talk about inclusion, but I don't like that framework because usually when people talk about inclusion, what they more often mean is inclusion into things as they are. We will keep power structures the same, we will keep organizations the same, but we will do you a favor of including you into this conversation, but we'll keep it white led, white dominant, white controlled, but you can come in. And what I like to talk about instead is centering. How can our organizations, our movements, and our programs center the work of disabled people of color, no matter what it is that we are working on, voting access, access to healthcare, preventing care rationing during the pandemic, decarcerating our people, whether in disability institutions or penal institutions, ensuring access to technologies in school or at work. How are we centering disabled people of color in this work? And you know, we could have a whole other conversation about this, but I'll just leave it at this. When we talk about ableism and how ableism defines disability and then therefore affects our lives, ableism has always defined both disability and ability against a framework of whiteness. Under white supremacist, racist thoughts, under racial oppression, whiteness is defined with being abled or not disabled, which means that disabled people of color Black, Brown, Native, Latinx, Asian, and mixed race people, we will always face the brunt of ableism, whether we see that in the statistics of who is criminalized in schools, of who is most likely subjected to psychi psychiatric hospitalization, or who is least likely to have access to the broadband connections and devices necessary for ensuring participation in virtual work or virtual school. In all of these arenas, disabled people of color face the sharpest disparities and the least access. And so my exhortation to people doing disability advocacy, whether in the realm of law and policy or outside the realm of law and policy is to ask, how can your organization return resources and cede power to disabled people of color and other disabled people at the margins of the margins? Because we bring a wealth of knowledge and experiences that people of privilege and power do not have to all of the work that we do. And if our perspectives are not centered, then we will be erased and excluded. It is not enough to include us into things as they are. We must change the way that we do things all together. Thank you, Lydia. Um, so, um, and there's so many wonderful things that are <clears throat> coming out of this, excuse me. <clears throat> um, of course, when the ADA was passed, it had a broad and, and, and since it, and in its history, it's had a broad definition of uh, what is a disability, who are people with disabilities, but whether it's the symbol of the uh, person in the wheelchair or otherwise, I think there was a sense uh, on the part of some that really the initial focus was more on physical disability and not other kinds of disabilities. So um, as the disability rights movement has asserted itself uh, both as a movement and, and in, in legal forms, 
Uh, there's been a greater emphasis, I think, on neurodiversity, on other kinds of disabilities, uh, on autism, cognitive disabilities, developmental disabilities. And Lydia, uh, how would you say in particular, as a person within that community, uh, that how you have seen self-advocacy within those communities operate, both with regard to uh, the broader society and also people with other disabilities as well. You've alluded to a little bit of this, but 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 do you have some other thoughts about that? This is Lydia. For me, as an autistic person who is also psych disabled and has cognitive disabilities, and earlier this year actually had a concussion, which for the record, zero out of 10 do not recommend, was not a pleasant or enjoyable experience, would not like to repeat, please return and take back. Thank you, universe. I've often found that the hierarchies of disability run deep and far. And this is true across disabled communities. It is not unique to only one facet of the disability and disabled communities. And one of the ways this comes up is in both again, individual rhetoric at the interpersonal level, but also systemic broader issues at the same time. I often find that when I'm in a space that is dominated by people who primarily have physical disabilities and do not consider themselves neurodivergent or to have mental disabilities, that they will say things like, well, I have this disability, I use a wheelchair, I was born with an absent limb, I'm an amputee, I am blind, but don't worry, everything's fine. Everything's working upstairs. My mind is fine. And the message that that kind of talk sends is that the reason that people who are not mentally disabled deserve rights or access is because they're not like me. And at the same time, in the autistic community of autistic people who don't have intellectual disabilities, I often hear similar rhetoric of, well, autistic people should be accepted. We deserve respect because autism isn't a mental illness or autism isn't an intellectual disability. And again, the underlying message of those statements is the reason that some autistic people deserve to be accepted is because those autistic people do not have psych disabilities or intellectual disabilities. And those messages are very damaging. But at a broader level, we can look at the makeup of leading disability rights and disability advocacy organizations. And we can see that by and large, there are so few people with intellect intellectual and developmental disabilities in positions of power or leadership outside of developmental disability self-advocacy organizations. When I look at the leadership of the largest, most well-resourced and most prominent disability rights organizations, not only is the leadership overwhelmingly white, but it is also overwhelmingly people who are not developmentally disabled, who do not have intellectual disabilities and who do not have psych disabilities. And that to me also sends a very clear message that people like me do not belong in leadership roles. I had a conversation recently, okay, by recently, this may have been a couple years ago because in the pandemic, we don't have time. It's timey, wimey, wibbly, wobbly stuff. At some point in the non-distant past, I had a conversation with another person who works in disability policy and has developmental disabilities. And this person noted an observation that still strikes me today, which is that in the Washington DC world of disability policy advocates, there are no people with developmental disabilities who are in positions of leadership, senior or management positions in any disability organization that is not a developmental disabilities self-advocacy organization. This person expressed a fear that in their future career, they might never be expected to advance, to be promoted, to have a senior level position if they stayed in disability world and in DC disability law and policy and advocacy world. This person was also white. For me, as a developmentally disabled person of color participating in this conversation, it's made me wonder. I am now only two years out of law school which first of all is an enormous privilege in itself to have attained that level of education. Most people in our communities are deprived of and denied access to that level of education. But even so, when I am in this position as someone who is a queer and trans disabled person of color and who has developmental disabilities specifically, I worry, does that mean that if I try to stay working in disability policy that I have no promotion potential? 
I'd really like to think that that's not the case. I hope that that's not the case. I hope and believe that those of us that are here today believe in and are working toward a future where we believe that all of us deserve to be respected, deserve to be in decision-making or leadership roles. But that conversation made me wonder, what does my future look like? Because while that's just one person's experience that represents a snapshot of our whole world, because this is really a tiny piece of the world, right? DC policy, the tiny piece of the universe. What does that say systematically about how disability advocacy operates, about the hierarchies of disability that say that people who have intellectual disabilities and people who have intense psychiatric disabilities are often at the bottom of the rung, along with people with certain autoimmune conditions, people who are deafblind, people who have uh, developmental disabilities that affect communication, speech, and movement. And of course, for those of us, again, that are at the margins of the margins, for those of us whose disabilities aren't even recognized as disabilities, like Carrie mentioned, that in every single marginalized community, the prevalence of disability is higher. And disabilities that are often unique or more likely to appear in our communities, we don't even usually recognize as disabilities. Like, for example, the discussion around fibromyalgia and lupus, which both disproportionately affect Black people who were assigned female at birth, is not the same level of discussion as that around disabilities that are racialized as white people's disabilities, like ADD, Down syndrome, or even autism, right? So in all of the ways that we talk about disability, we don't even include the forms of neurodivergence that are most likely to appear in communities of color and queer and trans communities. Collective trauma, trauma caused by war, displacement, and military occupation. Disabilities caused by environmental racism like lead poisoning in water, or cancers and long-term autoimmune conditions caused by fracking and pipeline spills. And in all of these ways, we, we don't have enough of a nuanced understanding of disability to challenge disability hierarchies, even within disability communities. Thanks, Lydia. Um, so Judy, um, wanted to ask you a similar version of this question. Uh, Lydia's put a number of important uh, points out there. Um, how do we build coalitions, I'd say, both within the disability rights movement between people with different kinds of disabilities and also outside the disability rights movement, people who uh, want to be allies uh, to folks with disabilities? I very much believe that we don't know enough about each other and that we've been isolated, not just by race, but by disability, and that many people that we define as having a disability do not define themselves as having a disability because of the stigma that they face. And so I think one of the issues we really need to be addressing is how do we expand our movement in a real meaningful way to ensure that we are making the systemic changes that Lydia is discussing. Um, one of the things that I really liked that Lydia presented earlier on was when we talk about inclusion, we're frequently talking about becoming included in the system that currently exists. And I believe, you know, that those of us in the disability community are really fighting for something broader than that, but I completely agree that we don't articulate it effectively enough, that we really, in looking at the kinds of social changes that we want to uh, be impacting um, in the community, I think it's both working within our own communities and working with other communities. So the absence of disability, regardless of the type of disability, in other organizations that are not disability specific is very much because of the isolation and stereotypes that exist. Um, it's communities that don't value us overall. And our, I don't know, um, I, I can just talk about, you know, my personal experiences when trying to get involved more with the women's movement, or I define myself as a Jewish disabled woman and issues within the Jewish community about biases around Judaism and disability, and trying to really get into these communities and help them understand why we are a part of the various communities and really looking at what needs to be done to um, look seriously at the forms of discrimination that have existed and how we dismantle that. I, I feel that we are so not there yet. And when we look at issues um, regarding people with various forms of disabilities, and getting people into jobs within the disability community, that I think is like critically important because we can't 
you know, when you look at the independent living movement, when you look at other aspects of the movement, in order for us really to be representative of all of the of the groups of people within the disability community, we need to have a very clear understanding of not only who is in and who is out and what is causing people not to be in, but we need to have a conscious plan about how we in fact bring about these changes. I think there are changes that are occurring. Uh, they're not occurring quickly enough. And I think, you know, we're a unique group in as much as, I don't mean this group here, but in general, because disabled people acquire their disabilities along the continuum of life. I think most of the people on this panel today have had our disability since we're younger and we've had different experiences. The people that are acquiring their disabilities in their 20s and their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, they not only don't define themselves as having disabilities, but they also don't have a vision of what their life should look like. They're not a part of our movement in many ways because we have not really brought them into our movement. So I, I think it's a multi-tiered approach. When we look at the work of other organizations, other civil rights organizations, excuse me, other rights-based organizations, I think the reality is we go into these groups, things have been changing a little bit because We've been involved for a longer period of time, but they still don't understand. They don't really understand the issues of discrimination. And even if they do understand the issues of discrimination, they don't necessarily understand what needs to happen in order both to provide a remedy um, and a change. So for me, you know, the remedy sometimes is more important. You've been denied a job because you're blind, because you have an intellectual disability, a mental health disability, whatever it may be. We need to address that issue of discrimination in order to get that individual group of people what they deserve. But fundamentally, we need to, when we're talking about you know, being inclusive across the board, we're really needing to make sure that in the studies that people are doing at the universities, that disability is not something way off in the side, but like you're doing at American University in law, as an example, I presume that many of the law students who graduate have some knowledge of what we're talking about around why the law is important to address issues of discrimination against disabled individuals. I hope it's not a handful of people, but for people who are gonna be going out into the myriad of professions uh, in law that they're gonna be uh, participating in, that they can on a regular basis understand who are the who is the disability community, what are the barriers that we're facing and how can they, in fact, whether they're disabled or not, really demand that some of these issues that we're discussing be addressed in a more proactive, timely way. When you listen to the diverse community talk about who is on the list of diversity, tell me the number of times the word disability is ever mentioned, like hardly ever. Yeah, you know, um, I, I think several of you have really, uh, talked about things which I think uh, reflect the fact uh, that we are still too stuck in a, a, a mode of thinking and operating in which we are trying to help people with disabilities adapt to an attitudinal and built environment that was not thought of with them in mind. And so I, I think Lydia's point and your point uh, on this are really, really quite salient. We have to think about all societal practices and structures in a way to think that our community includes people with disabilities. And, and in that itself, as you all have pointed out, is not just a group of people with one set of, of issues, but themselves quite varied in terms of their, their experiences. So it's, um, it's something that we keep seeming to have to uh, re-educate people about and relearn and, and talk about that because we're still in that kind of catch up type of, of uh, a phase it would seem. Uh, so um, I want to move to, uh, Carrie, you earlier alluded to, to voting, and given uh, the time of the year in which we're having this uh, conference, it seems like looking at voting uh, would be a good thing. And one of the things that I think uh, has been true about people with disabilities is that um, unlike some other uh, marginalized groups, uh, they're, uh, you know, they've, they've uh, been politically, there's liberal, there's, there's moderate, there's conservative, they've been different kinds of buckets, if you will. And as a consequence, sometimes the ways in which the parties uh, segment the population uh, operate in kind of different types of ways. But 
So there's that question about caring about the issues that people with disabilities want to see on the agenda. Uh, and then there's also, of course, just actual issues of access. Uh, we saw most recently the Supreme Court upheld Alabama's decision to not provide curbside voting for people with disabilities who needed that, which certainly is, is a problem. But Carrie, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, about the challenges that people with disabilities uh, have in, having, in voting and having their votes uh, uh, counted. Yeah, so this is Carrie. Um, it's, it's been interesting. So in my role at AAPD, I have the pleasure of leading and, and working with an incredible team that works to advance the disability vote. And um, Rutgers University, towards the end of September, released a report that showed that this year in 2020, there are over 38 million people with disabilities that are eligible to vote, um, which is incredibly exciting. Um, because we've been knowing for a while now that people with disabilities exist, that they are a powerful voting bloc, um, and um, that we're continuously growing. What we need to see done is that how do we transition from eligibility to registered to actively participating and voting in this year's election? And sometimes that can seem simple, like go out and vote, right? Um, but the deeper that you actually get into the conversation, it gets more complex because every state is different. Every state has different deadlines in terms of registration, in terms of if you want to vote by mail, if you want to do absentee voting. Um, every state has different regulations in terms of the form of ID that you can have. Um, does it need to be a valid ID? Does it specifically need to be a DMV issued ID? Every state has different regulations in terms of curbside voting. And not only do every state differ, um, but as you mentioned to your earlier point that these things are changing sporadically. So as particularly with COVID-19 happening, when we were in the primary season, we were seeing states that were the day before and the, in the morning of the election, we would get a new issue saying that something was different in terms of the time frame, in terms of what you needed to have available in order to actively vote. And in some ways that can be understandable because most folks were not prepared for COVID-19 and how that would impact folks' ability to access the polls and, and voting in general. But in a lot of ways it's created an unacceptable um, level of voter inaccessibility and suppression. And so what we've tried to do through RevUp, through um, AAPD and through a lot of different partners, not just in the disability space, but across the broader civil rights movement is to ensure that we're giving people the accurate information of how do you literally participate in this year's election. It's critically important because um, we're seeing the Affordable Care Act be under attack. We're seeing situations where folks might say, well, the Affordable Care Act and how it's being under attack is connected to the Supreme Court and we don't vote for Supreme Court justices. Um, but indirectly we do, because traditionally what happens is that our members of Congress are submitting recommendations to the president. The president makes the nomination of, the, makes the recommendation of who they want to see fill that seat. And then it's then voted again by Congress to see if they got pushed in. That's what we just saw with the recent new placement of our Supreme Court justice. That has consequences to healthcare. That has consequences to a lot of different issues that we see across our country. So one, I just wanna emphasize the significance and us being involved um, in our voting efforts this year. If there are changes that we need to see in terms of criminal justice, if there are changes that we need to see in terms of healthcare, if there are changes that we need to see in terms of institutionalization, transportation, it's so important that we're uplifting the message that the disability vote matters in that. Your vote matters in that. And unfortunately, we've seen too many circumstances where if you have an intellectual disability, if you have a developmental disability, if you are a person of color, if you are so many different, multiply marginalized demographics or marginalized in any type of way, you have been told that your voice, your thinking and your vote does not matter. And that's simply not true. So it's, I think it's critical that we're pushing the message that early voting is happening now, absentee voting is happening now. It's completely unacceptable and unfortunate that things are all over the place in terms of where you can go and how exactly you can vote effectively, but we still need you to invest in the process because change won't happen otherwise. It will stay the same. 
or things that we, you know, sometimes we want things to stay the same, but for the change that we want to see, we need you to be voting. The final thing that I will mention is once again, pushing back on the narrative that other civil rights community and other demographics are getting exposure that the disability community is not. We need to stop saying that. And I say that very intentionally because you can be black, you can be disabled, you can be woman all at the same time. So the issues that other civil rights communities are doing that are uplifting marginalized communities are important. And I think it's critical that for the disability community to recognize the gaps that have been occurring and say, I know I'm not trying to say that the broader civil rights community is perfect, but what I'm trying to say is that the disability community has issues with being able to embrace and collaborate with communities of color and communities that are not just white and disabled. And so I think we need to get to the point where we're building collaboration, we're using messaging and we're using techniques and uh, uh, techniques that allow us to get to the collective goal of like justice and freedom and whatever that looks like to you in a way that is inclusive of our intersection. Thank you. Um, and again, a lot of it is about, as the last uh, question and answer showed, building coalitions, building not only within disability, but between people with disabilities and other groups, recognizing that again, this is a complex identity and that all the groups we're talking about uh, function in multiple identities. And as Judy pointed out, that there are some people with conditions that might be thought of as part of the advocacy community, but they don't self-identify in that way. That also uh, complicates things greatly. Uh, we have just about five more minutes um, and I have more than five more minutes of questions, but I'm gonna uh, jump to the last one that I think is, is uh, I think might be interesting for this group. Um, and, and that is that we've been talking today and I think particularly in the context of the ADA about the disability rights movement, uh, but there's also a sense that um, there's a disability justice movement, which is not quite the same thing. And so um, I wonder, uh, this is really for everybody uh, or anybody uh, who, would who would like to speak to the differences between disability rights and justice and how you see those two movements uh, interacting if they do and what each might have to learn from the other. Uh, so I'm gonna, uh, uh, as they do in the game shows, make this a toss up question if there's anybody who would like to take that on first before I, before I call on somebody. This is Lydia. I'll take that first. I often draw the distinction between rights and justice in this way. Disability rights is concerned with using law and policy as a means of advancing the social condition of people with disabilities. Reform imperfect laws, pass and enforce better laws, and uh, repeal or abolish harmful laws. Disability justice, however, recognizes that while rights work is necessary, it will always be woefully insufficient because at the end of the day, you cannot legislate morality. We celebrate the 30th year since passage of the ADA this year. And yet we're having this conversation because so many organizations, companies, and even government agencies themselves routinely, flagrantly, and blatantly violate the ADA. The ADA exists, and yet disabled people fear discrimination in hospitals. The ADA exists, and yet disabled students, especially black and brown disabled students, fear criminalization in schools. The ADA exists, and yet despite the mass transition to online work and learning, a vast majority of platforms, policies, and procedures not only remain inaccessible, but are often overtly discriminatory, whether in monitoring people's movements, eye movements, body movements, typing, or how people interact with the world around them in ways that end up being discriminatory against disabled people, or in deciding which people should be able to access our virtual spaces at all. The ADA exists, and yet we are still fighting for rights today. So disability justice as a framework was created by queer and trans disabled people, black and brown disabled people, and queer and trans black and brown disabled people as a way of centering intersectional thoughts and solidarity work in disabled communities, drawing on disabled people's wisdom and knowledge to inform how our movements have to acknowledge and understand our value inherently outside of what laws or policies deem it to be. 
disability justice helps us go past all of those limitations because at the end of the day, no matter how much we enforce the ADA or how many other laws we pass, we still have a societal and cultural values problem. That's what ableism is. We could have the best laws on the planet, which we don't, but we could. And if even if we did though, we would still have to contend with the ways that we are all taught to believe ableist ideas. And that's what disability justice is about, is allowing us to radically transform our social and cultural values to account for all of our inherent worth and value, not despite our many identities, experiences, and communities, but in, through, and as the multifaceted people who we are. Thank you. Anyone else want to uh, take on this very uh, narrow question? Uh, Zaina, Deepa, we haven't heard as much from you. Um, this is Deepa. I can just, I agree with that distinction and what Lydia said. Um, I just wanted to add that, in my opinion, I think disability justice is also um, getting into the public consciousness that disability is part of the human condition and that we are, um, we are, we are valuable and we, and we matter and our issues are um, not a separate, not a separate civil rights issue, but our issues are everyone else's issues. And when we are folded into the conversation, when we are folded into um, the everyday um, actions that people take, you know, like hiring, um, you know, designing, uh, designing technologies, designing education, um, that when we are included in that, it makes things better for everyone. And that, you know, uh, disability um, in, you know, disability doesn't just affect the separate group of people, but it affects all of society and our issues are just as important as these other movements, these other movements that exist. And, um, and so I think disability justice is when we're, we stop being an afterthought, but we are fully incorporated into uh, the consciousness of, of society. Thank you, uh, Deepa. I think that's a, a very nice way to, to sum up this panel. Uh, we have reached the end of our time. I wanna thank all the panelists for their thoughtful contributions uh, and for uh, educating the entire group, I think, about, about some really tricky and, and complicated issues. So thank you all. And I'm now gonna turn it over to Alex Van Hook uh, and who will, uh, is our next uh, speaker um, who will be doing our, our final remarks. Take it away, Alex. Wonderful. Greetings, everyone. Um, my name is Alexander Van Hook, and I am a 2L student here at the Washington College of Law, WCL. I am one of this year's academic student bar association co-directors of accessibility. And I myself identify as a person with a disability. I use an electri electric wheelchair as well as I am deaf. So I have both of those disabilities. I would like to thank the wonderful speakers um, and panelists for their shared um, stories in regards to disability rights and advocacy in both past and present generations um, and before and after the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'd like to thank the WCL program on law and government for hosting the ADA 30th celebration, as well as thank the WCL Student Bar Association, the WCL Disability Law Society, and Verizon for supporting this momentous event today. As a law student who is passionate in disability rights advocacy, I recognize that legal education can be a powerful tool to push for change in the law and society so that society can become accessible and inclusive. But we need more lawyers with disabilities at the table. It is essential that law schools and bar associations are considerate about accessibility and inclusion so that law students and lawyers 
who have disabilities are able to focus on developing their legal analysis skills instead of focusing their efforts on struggles to get accommodations that they would need. In an effort to make the legal profession and consequently and ultimately the rest of society more accessible in conclusion, the ADA has boosted that ability. However, we still have a really long way to go as the Supreme Court of the United States lowers courts, federal, state, and local governments and legislators are still interpreting the ADA and there are still a lot of gaps as well as improvement that need to be approached. We need continued technology because it is changing. And as COVID-19 pandemic has proved, our times are definitely changing. We never will, we must never stop advocating for disability rights. And we need more people with disabilities, not only law students or lawyers, but we need more folks to continue to lead the disability rights movement. Nothing about us without us. Thank you, Alex. And our last uh, uh, presenter or speaker is Catherine Wright. Hi, all. Um, my name is Catherine Wright. And if you would have asked me five years ago if I wanted to be a lawyer, I would have said never. Yet here I am. And I am honored to be making the closing remarks here. I am a 3L student with an invisible disability. I am Alex's co-director of accessibility. I am the president of the Disability Law Society and a public interest public service scholar. While working as an educational advocate for kids in state care, I got a crash course in abuse and neglect, education law, and many other things. I found that the well-intentioned laws that protected and provided rights, like the ADA, did not necessarily support the people they mean to because of a lack of resources, state legislation, guidance, and implementation resources. I realized that in order to better advocate for my clients, I needed to understand the law better, further develop my skills, and that meant becoming a lawyer. Flash forward, I've seen how complicated the law is, how competing interests clash. As you've heard today, moving forward, we must work intersectionally and inclusively. Knowing that there are advocates out there doing this and pushing these ideas to the forefront, I have hope. I have more than hope. I know that the speakers and their organizations and their communities are doing this in order to, for, to move forward as we advocate, we must center people and people are intersectional. We must listen, learn, and lift up voices that are too often ignored. Thank you again to the panelists, speakers, and the SBA, the Disability Law Society eBoard, the program in law and government, and everyone else involved. Uh, this is a truly special conference. Uh, we really appreciate your time and work. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you everybody for your uh, participation in this webinar. Uh, that concludes the webinar, and we wish you um, uh, health and safety during this uh, these difficult times. Take care. <laughs>